Doctor, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks to the organizers of the Herzliya Conference for inviting me to speak today. First, I have to tell you that I was flattered to learn uh, that a lot of people here ask for my speech to be interpreted in English. <laughs> this is a, this is not a South Brooklyn accent. <clears throat> I have to begin by a special thank you to the <clears throat> to the Republican Jewish Coalition for hosting Marsha and me. Tw you know, psychiatrists, psychiatrists say that you should never stifle the urge to applaud. It's, uh, if it's not bad for you, it's bad for me. So uh, thank you over there for trying. <clears throat> 25 years ago, when I was the political director of the Reagan White House, I was assigned to midwife what has now become the RJC. From its quiet birth in the mid-80s, it's grown into an active and influential group of some 35,000 people across the United States, and its work has led to many Republican leaders better understanding and more strongly supporting Israel on vital issues it faces. Marsha, my, my bride of 39 years, is with me. Marsha and I had last visited Israel in 1994. Uh, much too long ago. Uh, I want to say I admire you for the progress that you have made in those 17 years. Uh, Israel today is a very advanced, dynamic country. The skyline in Tel Aviv testifies to that. Less obvious, but very profound, five Nobel Prizes since 2000. More scientific papers per capita than many could imagine a standard of living approaching the average of most of Europe and that of our area of the United States. This is a land built on few natural resources, but you have made more than made up for that with your human resources. Therefore, Israel weathered the recession better than almost any advanced democracy. And all this economic progress was properly recognized last year when Israel was welcomed into the OECD. Now, the good news for us in Mississippi is that Israeli aerospace, IAI, has shared some of that prosperity and technology with my state. Stark Aviation, a, a part of IAI, has built a plant in Columbus, Mississippi, where it makes unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, or, or drones, as you and I would call them, now, these high-tech jobs fit very well into our state's economic development plans, advanced manufacturing with advanced materials. And the Stark facility sits right next to a plant belonging to EADS, the, the giant European defense contractor, uh, at which EADS makes light utility helicopters for the United States Army. Uh, both are on a campus affiliated with Mississippi State University's Raspit Flight Center. But I have to say to you, as important as the jobs are for our people, we're also proud of the UAVs Stark makes, which contribute to America's homeland and national security. Another reason for Americans to be grateful to our friends in Israel. You know, as governor of Mississippi, where we've had offshore drilling for more than 50 years, I'm pleased to welcome Israel to the Offshore Oil and Gas Club. Uh, <clears throat> Sunday, Sunday, our group visited Noble Energy's drilling rig, Leviathan. Uh, it's about 75 miles or so west of Haifa. What a marvelous feat of engineering, science, and technology. This and related discoveries over the last decade or so almost amount to a second Israeli declaration of independence because energy self-sufficiency is crucial for any country. But it has to be particularly positive, a positive prospect for this country. Let me share with you, if I may, uh, a little bit from our long experience with the oil and gas production offshore. Energy independence may have risks, 
as demonstrated by the BP oil spill last spring. But those risks are not nearly as dangerous as the risk caused by energy dependence. <clears throat> you should know there have been 31,000 oil wells drilled in the Gulf of Mexico in the last 50 years. The BP oil spill is the only failure that is anywhere close to what happened. And it's clear it resulted from not following the normal, proper procedures. The failure was serious and costly, but absolutely preventable. The responsible party has paid for the cleanup and will pay for all the damages and any necessary restoration. Uh, surprisingly little residual damage or even effect is currently evident except in small areas of Louisiana. But the Gulf itself seems to have digested the disaster naturally. I tell you this to say that this preventable disaster should not become an, an excuse for a self-inflicted disaster. You're looking at your gas and perhaps oil production in the Gulf and I'm sorry, in the Mediterranean Sea, and the great prospects it has. Yet in our country, our administration is inflicting a disaster on America through its moratorium on drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, a moratorium, unfortunately, that is hardening into a permatorium. We in the United States need more American energy. The Wall Street Journal, though, reported recently that oil production in America will decline 13% this year. Our Gulf of Mexico produces about one-fifth of all U.S. domestic produced oil. So at a time when my country needs more American energy, this and other administration energy policies will drive up all Americans' energy costs, from gasoline to electricity prices. It will make our manufacturing and other businesses less able to compete in the global marketplace. I should say at this point that I'm not at all reticent to criticize President Obama's domestic policies and actions today. I publicly disagree with them at home and on domestic policy, I don't hesitate to state my differences while I'm over here. However, I subscribe to the school of politics in America that says on national security and foreign policy issues, politics stops at the water's edge. We shouldn't, don't criticize, or even disagree with our government's policies, actions, or statements when we're abroad nor do we try to or allow people to think we try to speak for our government. I do not. They say about 50 years ago that Conrad Hilton, the great hotel magnate, was on an extremely popular American television show. The host turned to him and said, Mr. Hilton, if you could tell the American people just one thing, what would it be? With millions of Americans watching, Hilton, a, a business icon, and really the Bill Gates of his day, he never hesitated. He looked right in the camera and said, put the shower curtain inside the tub. <laughs> now, here was a man that knew what was important to him. He knew the message that he wanted to leave. <laughs> What's important for me today is to share with you my view of the special relationship between our two countries. This, this trip has reminded me that our country, I'm sorry, that your country and the Israelis who inhabit it are our friends, not just allies, not only partners, but friends, friends who share our Western culture and more importantly, 
who share our values, our commitment to freedom, to the rule of law, democracy for all people regardless of religion or gender or ethnicity. I'm a Christian, uh, a Protestant, a Presbyterian, and I want you to know that there are tens of millions of American Christians who join me in recognizing Israel and Israelis are our friends as well as our allies and partners. Re <laughs> Regrettably, Regrettably, the vast majority of these Christians will never get to visit Israel. They won't see the holy sites of our sacred history or worship in the place where we feel especially close to God and the Bible given to us by the people of the book. Yet whatever our religious faith or lack thereof, all Americans can see Israel is the holy land of democratic faith. We know your values, which have been tested on the forge of unrelenting terrorist attacks, are the same values for which America has waged a war on terrorism since 9-11. That's why we are committed to a state of Israel that is secure, democratic, prosperous, and Jewish. We know, there, we know there are people in the world, and even in our own country, who don't res recognize Israel or its nationhood, who deny the fact that this is the immemorial and continuously occupied homeland of the Jewish people. Be assured that the overwhelming majority of American Christians are joined at the hip with American Jews in standing by Israel during this hour of turmoil or in any other time of crisis. We believe in your nationhood and we believe in your right to secure defensible borders. As, as enemies of Israel try to delegitimize the state of Israel through various propaganda ploys or one-sided UN resolutions, the vast majority in our country support Israel because you're our friend and ally, but also a valuable partner. And I hasten to add that our commitment to Israel is bipartisan. It extends across party lines. Yet, it must be hard for people in Israel to understand that there is a different troubling division about our special relationship because in Washington there are two broad points of view about the Israeli relationship. One point of view sees Israel as a problem. Uh, the people who take this point of view aren't necessarily unfriendly to Israel. It's just when they review the ledger of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, they see mostly cost. People who hold this view feel themselves correct to demand from Israel an endless series of dangerous strategic concessions even though they should know by now when Israel makes such concessions, in return all Israel is rewarded with are more rocket attacks. There's another view which I share. It's the view that Israel is a strategic asset, not a liability. Our relationship with Israel enhances American strength, economic strength, technological strength military strength, and moral strength. Ronald Reagan, for whom I work very proudly, held this view about Israel, not out of sentiment, but from experience. Two incidents occurred that perhaps are relevant. In 1981, President Reagan's first year in office, Saddam Hussein's regime was working on a nuclear bomb probably not for ornamental purposes. 
Israel launched a preventive strike to destroy Iraq's nuclear reactor. A lot of people condemned Israel, uh, even including voices in the United States government. But from the perspective of history, Israel's action has plainly served the strategic interests of every country interested in a peaceful future for the Middle East. The, the, very, next, the very next summer, Israel's military made a contribution with perhaps even more far-reaching consequences. In a series of encounters, U.S. made Israeli warplanes, knocked out one quarter of the Soviet-built Syrian Air Force, some 80 planes. Not a single U.S.-built jet was lost. The Kremlin must have been jolted. Sure, one could say the, uh, the Israeli pilots were better or whatever, but technology was passing the Russians by. The semiconductor revolution's powerful consequences must have become apparent to Moscow. The primitive Soviet economy simply couldn't compete in another arms race. That fact led to Gorbachev's perestroika, to Reykjavik, and to the Western victory in the Cold War. It must have colored President Reagan's strategic thinking on the U.S.-Israeli par partnership, and I can tell you, it certainly helped shape mine. I mentioned earlier how much change Marsha and I have seen in Israel since we were here 17 years ago in 19, 1994. Not only more prosperity, but a much larger, populous, and diverse country. At the same time, while Israel's been going in the right direction, it's clear that the situations in your neighboring countries have gone largely in the other direction. In 1994, when we were here, Egypt was 15 years into a peace with Israel based on a peace treaty that had positively changed the strategic situation for both countries. Turkey had a very friendly relationship with Israel and didn't make any bones about it. To the north, Lebanon seemed to be getting its government headed back to better times. Its religiously diverse population appeared to be pulling together and in the right direction. At that time, I could envision an economic zone in the eastern Mediterranean from Turkey to Egypt in which Israel would be a full participant. Syria may have participated. Imagine if exchange and commerce could flow freely today among the people and businesses of these countries without fear of terrorism or thought of extermination. Imagine how good that would be for the people of Lebanon, Turkey, Egypt, Syria, and Israel, for all the people of the region and the world. That all seems Pollyannish today. I hope not. But one must recognize realities. If a leader doesn't honestly face the facts, it's very hard to solve problems. And we must be judged, or we must judge our leaders not based on hopes and intentions, but based on the actual results we achieve. For those who care about Israel, or about the Western world for that matter, we must recognize and focus on Iran as the crucial strategic issue. Iranian support of terrorism, its destabilization of governments, its military nuclear program, and its goal of eradicating Israel and, frankly, of destroying Western civilization and its foundational values. The panel here discussed things that could be done, and it's important to debate the Iranian threat. At a minimum, it should lead to a strategic consensus, not just in Israel, 
But in the world today, the number one threat to peace and stability is Iran. Uh, if And to solve problems, you got to first face facts. Now, are there other problems? Sure. Can we and should we deal with other challenges? Of course. But as one of the gentlemen up here said, we cannot take our eye off the ball. This is much better understood here than it is in my country. Still, Americans know real peace in the Middle East can only come when the region accepts Israel is not only here to stay, but is a welcome neighbor and a valued economic partner. When it's universally agreed that this region can be home to people of all faiths, not just one faith. Israelis are probably not expecting many thanks from the rest of the world for contributions to the security of the West, yet thanks are due, maybe overdue. In this week when we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of President Reagan, this proud Reagan conservative is delighted to have a chance to leave you with what the 40th President of the United States might have said if he were here at Herzliya. Well done. Thanks. We're with you. And we're glad you're with us. Thank you very much. I want to thank Governor Barber for taking the time to come and being with, to be with us this evening.